so I'm grateful in so many ways to be able to introduce to you the people, it's their fault, that I'm here today. Um, they are the reason that I am your friend or foe. <laughs> they are the reason. It is through their faithfulness. It is through their dedication. It is through their commitment. Uh, they were ministering long before I knew what ministry was. Uh, long before, I certainly did not know on that day in 1985, 33 years ago today, I was floating down a river called New Braunfels. And if you've, that's in Texas outside of Austin. And I was floating with my cousin, drifting down the river. Those of you that are part of this house know the story. My mom is streaming live today. And the parts of this story that you don't know, mom, I repent for now. <laughs> But we were floating down that river that day, and as we did almost every weekend, there was me on one tube, my cousin on another tube, and Bartles and James on another tube. <laughs> and we floated down that river, and there were, Bartles and James had a few friends, and we partook and we fellowshiped with the friends in that particular tube. They, were, they happened to be on ice, and um, we would float. But that day, at the end of the day, we were done and we left. And my cousin had a little bit more of those, the fellowship than I did. So I was more fit to drive. And I drove. And it's about a two-and-a-half-hour drive from New Braunfels to, to where I lived. So on the way home, even though the day before we had left, there was no construction, no barricades, no nothing. The next day, coming home on Sunday, when we were returning... There were barricades, and there were detours. And I had to take a detour in order to get to my house. So when I took the detour, the detour sent me down a road in Houston where I grew up, a road called Aldine Westfield Road. And when I took that detour, I passed this large church called an Assembly of God that was on the right-hand side of the road. I remember it today. And I remember looking at the marquee, and it said Evangelist Hank Davis ministering. And as soon as I saw that sign, I'd never heard of him. I didn't know what Assembly of God was. In fact, my cousin said, you can't go there. You don't know what God's assembled there. And literally, he didn't know God. I didn't know God. We weren't even interested in what God wanted. But we knew, I knew, something provoked me. At the, that day, didn't know what it was. Today, I know it is Holy Spirit. But that day, I didn't know. And I told my cousin, I'm going. And I went home. I changed my clothes. Long story short, I walked into that building. When I walked in, I had my sunglasses on, my Ray-Bans or whatever they were back then. I walked in. Probably Ray-Bans because they've kind of made a circle three times. But I had my Ray-Bans on, and I walked in. I sat on the back row of that church, and I listened to this preacher preach. In my world, he was, at that time, he, there was a cockiness about him that I appreciated because I felt like there was a cockiness about me long been delivered of that but then I felt like there was a cockiness about me and there was something I identified with in him it didn't have anything to do with personality it had everything to do with spirit it had everything to do with anointing something in me that I didn't recognize called out to something in him that he did recognize and at the end of that service he said is there anybody here you've never met Christ and he preached a message and he remembered the message when I invited him here he preached the message will the real Jesus Christ please stand up I'm probably telling, telling some of the story he's going to tell this morning. And he preached that message, and he gave an invitation. And I walked down the aisle, and the rest is history. I met Christ, and I never looked back. I never looked back. And I can tell you today, we're gathered in this house this morning. We're doing what we're doing today because this man and this woman were the genesis for my salvation and my walk in the kingdom of God. Certainly, it was Christ that brought me in but they introduced me to the Christ that brought me in then they believed in me they didn't even know me and he would call wherever they were they were in Hawaii they could be anywhere he was evangelizing he was all, they were all over the world at that time everywhere and he would call me are you reading? are you praying? what are you doing? how are you doing? they would come and they would preach again they took me to dinner invited me to go be a part of a house that they were getting ready to start. And I'll leave it at that. If they want to tell any more after that, they can. Ultimately, I'll tell you this. I ended up going. But my walk in the kingdom, the man that I would eventually become, 
I would have never met the people that have influenced and impacted my life had I not responded to the word that he released on July the 8th, 1985, 33 years ago today. The man that I am today, I am that man because they preached the gospel that changed my life. I'm going to give them a microphone in just a second, and they're going to minister to you and me. I want you to shout. I want you to laugh. I want you to rejoice. I want you to receive. I want you to be changed. I want you to make a draw. I want you to hear what you've never heard. I want you to be ready to receive revelation. I want you to get ready to understand what didn't make sense to you yesterday, but for some reason it does today. I want you to be ready because I can tell you today we're gathered in this house because of the faithfulness of this man and this woman to be faithful to their call way back on July the 8th of 1985. Would you stand with me this morning, put your hands together, and would you welcome Pastor Hank and Pastor Rhonda Davis. I'm just going to, you can be seated, thank you. I'm just going to briefly say something. Pastor Hank has a word. I'm sort of like a spiritual grandmother. I'm in tears. I'm in joy. It has truly been like heaven here this morning. Amen? In this worship. And uh, it's just been like heaven. And uh, Steve, Pastor Hank did preach the word. I was just in the audience. Um, <laughs> But um, we did grow to love him so much, and he did come, and I actually forgot I had a dream in Hawaii that he would be our youth pastor and towed Pastor Hank, and of course, he made it happen. We have two beautiful daughters, um, one that has a child, and her husband was promoted to heaven last year. Heaven came for him, Angel Mercado, and we have a younger one, uh, 17, but we never had a son. But you know, as many of us know in this room, the Lord can fill in that gap in so many ways. And um, I'll probably be a mess, so I'm going to have to stop. But I'm 57, and I cry a lot. But um, uh, this is my soft side, but I can get pretty loud and energetic. But I just want to be brief. But he lived with us and became so much of a son to us. And then he met Kimberly and all oh, the stories we could tell you. And, um, and I want to tell his kids at lunch how mad he was at her one time and I said he is desperately in love with her I mean he is so in love with her he cannot see straight and um, yes and so uh, the Lord brought them together and we just love you this has just been a touch of heaven I believe it's meant so much to us and to you it's a red letter day um, but it's just been, means so much to us to come. Looking at you this morning, you look like heaven. Your color, your culture, your worship, your, your just your diversity, everything, in every sense of the word, you feel like heaven this morning. And um, I'm so excited to, under Miss Kim's leadership, to speak to the women that come tonight. Um, and I will save everything I have bottled up inside of me. And I will release myself off the stage. Um, this is my Creek Indian husband. And I've loved him for a long time. Married him twice. That's another story. Been married for 36 years, I think. We were divorced for about a couple years, three years. And the Lord divinely restored us And uh, about 36 years ago. And um, he is my soulmate. And the, he taught me everything I know about preaching. You're going to receive from him. So I'm going to give it up to him. We love you. And I'm so honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I said I wouldn't tell it to a living soul. How I found salvation and he made me whole. But I found I couldn't hide the love that Jesus did impart. Because he makes me laugh and he makes me cry. Sets my weary soul on fire. The day that God dipped his pen of love in my heart. You ask me why I'm happy, why I sometimes and always shout, because God put something in my heart that I could shout about. I met him at an altar the good old-fashioned way, met him at a mourner's bench where I knelt down to pray, and since then, 
this is my story. This is my song. Washed in his blood, born of his spirit. If you could see where Jesus brought me from to where I am today, then you would know the reason why. I love him so. He is a good God. Could you give him just an appreciation of affection? He is a good God. He is a good God. He is a good God. I love what God is doing here. I love, I love the, the, the spirit of excellence. There's just something about being excellent and serving the community and serving uh, the, the congregation. I love what God has done here in the past several years, as, as Steve has mentioned. It's unusual for me to not call him Pastor Steve, but we're going to go with the flow and call him, call him Steve. Uh, he... Uh, uh, I, 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 ironically, I remember the very night in the parking lot when I met him, and I remember the sermon, and it wasn't that great of a sermon, but he said that well, he, later when he gave his heart to the Lord, he said he didn't hear any of the sermon. God was tugging on his heart, and we brought him into our home and made him a part of our family, and as Rhonda said, we have a lot of spiritual daughters and a lot of spiritual sons, but not a natural son. And we did everything together. We fished, we hunted, we had a blast. He became our first youth pastor in one year. He grew the youth over 100 in one year and did our youth camps and traveled and ministered. And in all of that traveling and ministry, we reconnected with a lifelong friend who's here this morning. Al Mango made it. He's here in the house. Al Wave, if you will. 67 countries has touched the world, has touched the world, and uh, Al traveled with us full time. We ministered eight years evangelists, touched the, the nation and the world, Al traveled with us, and so many good times, so many good memories, and here we are today making brand new memories with family, and I'm excited about hanging out with Steve and Kim's kids, and something about uh, Kim has always been beautiful. Steve has kind of grown into looking good the <laughs> latter part of his life. And um, I remember we introduced them and we insisted that they date. And uh, it was, uh, I remember the one time Pastor Rod said, Steve got so mad. It was over something. It, just, it wasn't really, it wasn't really, if you know Steve, you know, it wasn't yet. They weren't even dating. But uh, we, we knew right then that it was love at first sight and God was doing a great thing and it's it's just a joy to be a part of that what God is saying what God is doing uh, February I celebrated 38 years of being clean from cocaine Marlboro uh, marijuana and LSD as Pastor Rhonda mentioned I was a general contractor in Southern California built a library for Dr. Robert Schuler. did a lot of incredible projects uh, married her right out of high school she was 18 she graduated in May I married her in August and, and a year into the marriage, we had all the toys. We had a home in Huntington Beach. We had a Lotus. We had a Harley. We had a Mustang. All the, all the, all the things that you think that a general contractor, a general contractor needs. And uh, in the process of that one year of marriage, I had an affair with cocaine, and uh, got horrifically hooked and began to shoot coke between my toes, because I didn't want my contractors to know that I was using. And through a year and a half of hell, she left California moved to Cleveland, Tennessee, and enrolled in Lee University. We were divorced three years. No communication, no contact, no phone calls, no letters, no nothing. After uh, the, 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 the night that she walked out of my life, that particular night I went to a church a lot like this and gave my heart to the Lord. It was a glorious, it was a glorious moment. Went home and then began the process of God rebuilding my life. He thrust me into ministry. I became an evangelist, and I was preaching a revival in Dalton, Georgia, which is about 20 miles from Cleveland, Tennessee. And her and a couple of friends came out to visit. And uh, in the process of that of that revival, God restored us, healed us, and she came crawling back, and I remarried her. <laughs> and um, as um, as Rhonda mentioned, we have two precious daughters that are both involved in ministry. Our youngest is a part of uh, Perry Stone ministry team. Just got back from Israel, get ready to go to India. 17, she loves the Lord. Our oldest is now our youth pastor, and, and you were her first, you were her very first youth pastor. Is that scary? So it just the, so just the generations just seem to layer and just seem to just seem to layer and layer. Uh, 
a pilot flew two of his business friends to the Bahamas and on the way there was a storm and there was a wreck and they crashed the plane and they survived on a large but a desolated island. Days turned into weeks, weeks turned into months. One morning they saw a bottle floating out in the ocean. One guy swam out and got it, brought it back, put, took, took the cork out and a genie came out of the bottle. And the genie looked at them and said, you know, I usually give one man three wishes, but since there's three of you, I'll give each one of you a wish. First guy said, man, I miss my wife. I miss my wife. I miss my kids. I wish I was home. Poof, he was gone. The second guy said, man, I miss my fiance. I miss my fiance. I miss my job. Poof, he was gone. Third guy said, well, I don't have a wife or a fiance, but I sure do miss those two guys, and I wish they were back. (laughs) I thought you might, I thought you might enjoy, I thought you might enjoy that. Um, if you brought a weapon this morning, you probably won't need it. I want to look at Isaiah 40 and 31. But they that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. If the Lord allows me for a few minutes this morning, I just want to talk about the way of an eagle. Proverbs 13, 18, the writer makes a statement. There are three things that are too wonderful, four that I cannot grasp. And the first thing that he comments is the way of an eagle in the air. Uh, This message, this journey began 35 years ago in Ketchikan, Alaska. I was there conducting a meeting. I brought my dad and spent some time with him. And we made, an, we made a, an appointment to go fishing just for the halibut. The halibut there is in Ketchikan, Alaska. You are sharp church this morning. You caught that. I, I better be careful. If, if, I'm glad you hear what I'm saying, but if you could hear what I'm thinking, it'd be even better. But I won't go there this morning. And uh, dad and I reserved a, a boat, and we got up at 4 o'clock in the morning. An amazing. You get up at 4 a.m. and go hunting and fishing and shopping but you can't get up at 7 o'clock and pray? Oh, well, just a thought, just a possibility. So uh, we, headed to the, we headed to the marina, and as we got head toward the marina, there was a construction uh, zone taking place, and we were stopped, and I got out of the car and went and talked to the contractor. I was a, being a contractor. I was interested in what they were doing. I said, I said, what are you doing? He said, well, he said, we're widening the road from two lane to four lane, and I said, well, how's it going? He said, well, he goes, we can't w- really work all winter. There's just a few windows in the summer that we can work. And we were doing pretty good until we got to this tree. I said, okay, well, what happened? He said, well, the tree is too close to the ocean to go around, and it's too close to the mountain, so we have to dynamite a chunk of the mountain away to go around the tree. And I said, why would, why would you do that? Why don't you just cut the tree down and build the road right over the, 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 the tree? He said, well, that's the challenge. The challenge is this tree, you can't see it from here, but it has an eagle's nest at the top of this tree, and the state of Alaska would not allow us to touch this tree because of that nest. And I said, you've got to be kidding. He said, no, I'm not kidding. And something happened in that moment that I became fascinated with the eagle. Uh, I have been to Montana. I've been to Minnesota. I've been back to Alaska eight times to not just preach, but to see if there's an eagle somewhere in the neighborhood that we could look at or get a get a picture of there's just something fascinating about the eagle daniel had a dream and a lion roared and out of the mouth of the lion a man with eagle's wings appeared and we believe that lion to be great britain we believe that man with eagle's wings to be the united states of america Benjamin Franklin didn't want to select the eagle as our mascot. He was, he was pulling for the turkey because he thought the, turkey, he got, the eagle was lazy. But come to find out there's absolutely nothing lazy about the eagle. The Israeli airport, Air Force pilots, the best in the world, the, the best fighter pilots, they spend weeks, months, years examining the eagle, the flight pattern of the eagle, the way it can move and dart and soar. It is a phenomenal Creature, There have been so many uh, things that have happened to us. I remember that we were in uh, Kenai, Alaska, and we were fishing, and we were catching some, some salmon, and they were pretty good-sized salmon. And we noticed there was, a, there was a tree, and there was an eagle in the tree watching us. And the guy caught a fairly nice salmon. He said, watch this. He took the salmon, and he threw it as high as he could in the air. And before that salmon hit the, the ocean, that eagle was there. 
And as that salmon tried to swim off, that eagle went, weighed about six pounds. The salmon was about 18 pounds. It completely went underwater and then just blew up with that salmon in his, in his claws. And that was so amazing. I read an article about a Delta pilot flying at 35,000 feet above sea level was startled when a large salmon crashed into their windshield. The only thing that they could determine, an eagle was flying above the plane and got distracted and drop that fish and as you begin to look at the life of the the eagle and the the time the bible refers the eagle all the amazing things that the eagle can do the eagle has a very unusual eyelid that allows him to look directly into the rays of the sun he is the only creature that has the ability to do that as steve mentioned we have to have ray-bans or oakleys or maui gems but eagle doesn't need anything he's got a built-in ray-ban that allows him to keep his eye on the sun the eagle does not need a landing strip to land or a, or, 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 or a ramp to take off. He can land on a nickel and take off on a dime. And he has an attitude. If you've ever noticed, the eagle doesn't look at you. It looks through you. And an eagle has this ability to, to kind of glare you down and look you down and, and let you know that he really is the real deal. And when the storms come, most animals will hide. I don't know. We have uh, We now have a... Uh, a dachshund and when the storm comes the rain comes it will go hide under the couch not the eagle the eagle begin to pace he'll begin to walk back and forward because he knows where he last left the sun and when the storm gets its worst when the, ro- the thunder begins to roar the lightning flashes he leaps and he blows through that cloud barrier and right there where he left it was the sun I'm here to tell you this morning, if you keep the son of righteousness with healing in his wings, if you keep your eyes focused on him, and the storm's going to come, the storm's going to pass, but he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. The eagle, I want to go, go quickly this morning. This is about a six-hour seminar. I'm going to combine it in, in just a few minutes. But I had the privilege of going to Billings, Montana, and preaching for Morcerello. I was doing two evening services, and one evening they had announced that I was going to be preaching on the eagle. So as I started my, my, my message, I noticed at the back of the tent there was a, an entourage that walked in, and it was the chief of the, of the uh, crow nation and his entourage and a little intimidating but you know how a preacher is they just we just take off and just go for it and we were ministering and the altars were full. It was just a great it was a great crusade it was a great time and at the end of the service one of the uh, representatives came up to me and said hey the chief would like you to come to his house and enjoy some fellowship and I said well we're going to smoke a peace pipe or what what kind of fellowship <laughs> you're talking about here and so we went and fellowship and he looked at me, and here's what he said. He said, you know more about the eagle than any white man I've ever met. He said, I want to tell you something. He said, there was a generation years ago that it was the, the, the motivation of a 12- or 13-year-old boy to dig a hole. He would dig a pit, and then he would cover it with branches, and then he would go, and he would catch. He would snare a rabbit or a squirrel. He would tie that rabbit squirrel off to a twine, and then he would watch that animal. And when the eagle came by to swoop down to catch up that rabbit or that squirrel, the eagle at an elevation of 10,000 feet above sea level, that's almost two miles, has the eyesight. He can see a rabbit or a squirrel blink, fall out of the sky at 227 miles an hour, and snatch up that rabbit or snatch up that squirrel. Well, it was, the, it was the goal of this 12-year-old boy to watch not the eagle, but to watch the bait. And when that eagle swooped in to catch that rabbit or squirrel, if he was on, on the ball, if he was paying attention, he would reach out and grab those, ta- he'd grab those talons with his hand. And as that eagle was dragging him out of that hole, he would reach over and he would pluck a feather. And if he accomplished that, obviously an incredible task he would move into the chief's teepee and become the chief's armor bearer and the chief would teach him the ways of war the ways of the people and if you remember the black and white where the the wagon trains are circled and you look up on the hill and there's thousands of Indians and there's one in a full headdress and then to the left is a, a, a brave with just one feather that's him 
That's the chief's armor bearer, and he goes in battle, and he carries the chief's weapons. And I thought, how incredible is that to know that, that the value? You know, 30 years ago, the eagle was almost instinct. It was almost, uh, help me with the word. Yes, that word too. And uh, they were protected, but now they have come back. The eagle, like the dove, what a combination, mate for life. When they select their mate, they mate for life. I think Steve and I have been dove hunting a couple times. I said, Steve, make sure and kill two, because if you don't kill both of them, then one's going to be a widow the rest of his life, and I don't want that on me. (laughs) But when the eagle sees a young lady that he's attracted to, he will throw up that. He's got the physique of a weightlifter because all he eats is meat. A powerful chest, narrow waist, powerful thighs, and he will strut up to that little, little young lady, and he'll strut. He'll make a little, little noise. She completely ignores him, and she will go and find a stick, and she'll grab that stick with that powerful beak, and she'll fly up into the air, and he will join her, and she'll drop the stick. And if he catches the stick, she shows a little interest only to ignore him and get another stick. And she doesn't fly quite as high, and she drops it. If he catches the stick, he's in. If he misses the stick, he's out of there. If he catches the stick, they fly to the top of the sky, lock their claws, wrap their rings around one another, and fall. And when when they fall, the two become one, and they are together for the rest of their life, which can be as much as 80 years. An eagle can live 80 years. He does not become bald until he's at least five years old. That's a mature eagle. See, a bald eagle, that eagle is is at least five years old. But in this relationship, they begin to build a nest. There are three things that have to be in the area of that nest. There has to be running water. An eagle's going to build next to a creek or a a river or a stream. There has to be running water, and there has to be in the area. Although eagles don't eat honey, there has to be a place in the area where bees are creating honey. And the third, the eagle will build its nest where there is a rock, and a, it's an, a rock that produces oil because when the eagles fly into the heavenlies, they get their wings battered a little bit, so they go lean up against the rock and get the oil from the rock on their wings. Aren't you glad this morning that we have a rock that's higher than us that we can lean on and we can just get that oil on us and be covered in that oil? So, so he selects a tree. To tree planted by the river, to tree the roots go deep in the ground, is a tree that's been around quite for quite a while. And then they begin to crash into trees and remove limbs. I have a DVD of a bald eagle crashing into a limb three inches in diameter and ripping that branch from that tree. They will build that nest right here in a collar. There is an eagle's nest that's two tons, that's 4,000 pounds, that he builds his nest to last a lifetime. Not only does he build a nest to last a lifetime for him, but the eagle is not intimidated, and he'll allow smaller birds to build their nest in the shadow of his nest. It is not my desire one day to stand before God and be complimented on the books I've written or the sermons I've preached, or the songs that I've sung, or the places I've... That's not my goal. My goal one day is to stand before God with my wife on my left, my two daughters on my right, and for them to declare that I lived a life that was so clean, that was so clear, that they saw my life and they made heaven their home because I was that light in a dark place. That's my goal. And that was the attitude of the eagle. He wasn't intimidated. They'd build their nest. And then when they got their nest done, they would find a white birch tree and they would rob the limbs from this birch tree and they would line the top of their nest with white birch. The reason for that, because in the mountains, a storm would come, the forest would get dark, but the eagle could look through the forest and see that little bit of white and know that that was home. I don't know how he takes the black heart of a sinner and washes it with the purple blood of a Savior and makes us white as snow. I don't know how he does it, but aren't you glad this morning you've been to the river, you've been dipped in the blood, and now you are the righteousness of God, and we become more righteous the more we hang around him and do the things he likes to do. They build the nest, and sooner or later, something crazy appears in the nest. And I have learned that buzzards birth buzzards turkeys birth turkeys and eagles birth eagles 
and not throwing off in the back row, it's just something that preachers say, but if you sit on the back row and you gripe about the sermon or the length of the pastor's hair or his crazy antics and, and your kids hear you, you're raising up kids just like you. Hello. I want to raise up kids that are healthy and whole, that love the pastor, trust the pastor, have confidence in the pastor, and want to be a part of that. Eagles birth eagles. And all of a sudden, there in that nest that the eagle had, had leapt out, had sought out a fox or a mink, ripped the meat from the fox and lined that nest, that soft nest with the, all of that down and all that soft. And there's mama right there in that egg, taking care of that egg. And then from time to time, mom would leap out and she would go hunt to feed herself. And this big old macho eagle would sit right on that egg and take care of that egg and watch over that egg. And lo and behold, before long, the egg cracks and out comes out a mouth tied to a little bit of flesh. And the mouth is always open. Food, food, feed me, feed me, feed me. And that's all the eagle, the baby eaglet would do. An eaglet is like a teenager. They never get full. They just get tired. They'll take a nap, then come back and eat some more. Do I have a parent in the house that can relate to that? So, so every time he opens his mouth, mama feeds him. But mom feeds him what he is able to eat. Aren't you glad this morning that we're not on oatmeal and we're not on, on, on raisin bran, but our pastor feeds us meat and we're able to eat meat and digest and grow and become what God wants us to become. Well, sure enough, he begins to eat that meat. He begins to grow. And then they come up with a realization that two is company, but three is a crowd. And the nest is getting, it's just getting frustrating. He's in there. It's all about him. Hello, it's all about him, mom and him, mom and dad are taking care of him, watching over him. And so mom will fall out of the nest and there in the shadow of that tree is a rock. The rock was picked before the nest. See, the tree can crash and burn, but the rock isn't going anywhere. And you'll get that in just a moment. In the shadow of that tree, she builds a miniature nest lines it with tree limbs and then goes and, and seeks out a fox or a mink grabs a fox takes the meat up to mouth up there and she lines that little nest with that little fox just soft and cuddly and then she go back to the top of the tree deuteronomy says as an eagle stirreth her nest she accidentally on purpose bumps him out of the nest and he falls on the rock ow mom what are you doing what's going on and then he looks around and he sees it, his, his, his nest, his crib, his cave. Man, he gets in it. It's soft. It's cuddly. He leans back on that fur. He looks up. Rock, rock, rock. Mom comes by, drops stuff in his mouth. He's got it made in the shade. I mean, this is the life of Riley. He has got it made. Kind of reminds me of a new Christian. I remember when I first got saved, I went to every Bible study. I went to every prayer meeting. I went to every revival. I listened. I kept Phil Driscoll in my, in my cassette. I don't know if you can be friends. Man, he and I, we would, we, would, we would get together and we would pray and we would worship and I would cry and I would bawl. I love that and I don't ever want to lose that feeling. We were listening to Phil this morning, very good friend of ours, and we were listening to him this morning and I still cry and I still bawl and I still feel, feel like that brand new Christian that every morsel I get from God is precious. Every, everything that he chooses to feed me through my pastor is precious and it's very important to me. Well, as that, that baby is eating and growing, all of a sudden he comes to a place where he's at the place where he needs to pursue his destiny. An eagle was born to fly. The challenge of the baby eagle that in the shadows of the rocks, there's a rattlesnake. And that rattlesnake has a plan to destroy that baby eaglet. And that rattlesnake wants to come up into that nest and wants to devour that baby. Well, mom knows that baby was born for a higher purpose. So one day she falls out of the tree and lands on the rock and she looks around, and he looks around. Hey, Mom, what's up? And she walks over and very casually reaches her beak in that, in that nest and grabs that fox skin and throws it aside. He thinks he sees Mom messing with his nest. So, Jimmy, he goes and gets in it. It's there, but it's not quite the same. Listen, change is uncomfortable. Maturity is uncomfortable. 
I mean, I mean, there are things when you begin to grow and step in the things of God, it's uncomfortable. And thank God that he's in charge and he knows that you can handle the change. You can handle the season, what you're going through. And so he gets out and he looks at mom and says, Mom, you're messing with my nest. Well, mom walks over and she just grabs the nest and just throws it over the side. He spends a cold, lonely night on that rock. But in the morning, but in the morning, weeping endures for a season. I can take you today within inches of where I came to the Lord hooked on drugs. I can move you over just a few feet and I can show you where I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then I can take you to another part of that altar. That church is still there today. I can do that altar. I can show where God divinely called me to the nations of the world. I, I remember that day. But here's what I've learned. My hope is not invested in a sanctuary in Westminster, California. My hope is not invested in a church building at Agassiz Drive, Cleveland, Tennessee. My hope is not invested in my pastors, Marcus and Joni Lamb. My hope is not invested in that television station. But there is a rock that I can go to. There is someone there that cares about me. And when I'm hungry, he's my bread of life. When I'm thirsty, he's my river of living water. When I'm tired, he is my eternal rest. And when I'm in trouble, he's the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Now, that baby eaglet doesn't know that yet, but he's about to learn a very valuable lesson. The rock ain't going anywhere. The rock is going to endure. It can endure forest fires, avalanches, earthquakes, tsunamis. The rock is there. And we cling to that rock, that rock of ages that's cleft for me. Well, he does doesn't get it but he will he looks up and when the when the morning sun came up there was mom and dad watching over him all through the night weeping in dirt they're, they're watching and he looks at him and goes mama <laughs> mom it's cold down here mama mama falls out of the tree and lands on the on the rock takes those powerful claws that can carry a, a doe a hundred yards before it realizes it's too heavy to carry. A kangaroo in Australia ca ca kangaroo carried a kangaroo a hundred yards before he realized it was too heavy for him to carry. But those powerful claws will take that beautiful little eaglet and put him on her back and then she'll walk right up to his greatest fear. That, that drop, that thousand foot drop, he would begin to explore and he would see that drop and he would look back and go, no, I ain't going to mess with that. She would walk right up to his greatest fear and leap off that rock man he's got those tiny little claws buried in the back of her neck mama mama what are you doing mama take me back to that rock right now in Jesus name <laughs> no matter how powerful that name is there are times in maturity he ain't gonna, he ain't gonna respond to that prayer <laughs> mom reaches the top of the sky and then she just turns upside down and he falls and you talk about an accident looking for a place to happen. Those little wings, that little beak, those little claws, he's tumbling, he's turned. And right when it looks like he's going to crash into the ground below, let me tell you something. You can't fall as fast as your God can fly. He rides on the wings of the wind and the clouds or his chariots. And when you think you're in trouble, that's when he picks you up and takes you to where he is at. And that's where we dwell in the house of the Lord. Is that not a good feeling this morning? He thinks he's going to crash and burn. Mom catches him and takes him right back to the top of the sky. And she drops him and he falls. She does something the second time she didn't do the first time. As he falls, she falls with him. And as both free fallen, she'll begin to call out to him. Rah! Rah! Now, I'm not sure that's exactly how it sounds, and it hurts, my, it hurts my throat to do that, so I won't do it anymore. But she's saying, fly, fly, flap them wings, boy. You were born for a higher purpose. It's in you. There's destiny in you. There's ministry in you. It's there. Experiment a little bit. Just get those little wings out there. And he hears a voice that he trusts. 
He hears a voice. He has confidence. And right there in that, in that horrible moment, he responds to that voice. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice and the voice of another they will not follow. Aren't you glad that there's a friend that's sticking closer than a brother, that we can trust his voice, we can trust his direction, trust his input in our life. He throws up those little wings, and the wind, you can't see where it is, where it's been. It catches him, and he begins to the top gun. He begins to cruise. He begins to, he begins to experiment with that. And the whole time that mom is giving junior flying lessons, guess where dad's at? Top of the sky, watching over his family, taking care of his family, taking care of mama, taking care of baby. We have, we have a heavenly father ever lived in the mountains of glory, interceding for us, watching over us. God rides on the wings of the wind. The clouds are his chariots, and we're a part of that. He is never sleeping. He's always watching over you. If you fast forward almost 40 years, somewhere around the age of 50 or 60, something happens to the eagle. His, his beak gets infected, and there's a calcium deposits around his beak. His, his mouth becomes real sore, and his claws start drying out, and they start tearing away, and they start shredding, and, and he realizes there's something going on in his life. He loses his ability to fly. And he starts to walk everywhere he goes. No longer is he flying in the third heaven. No longer is he the king of the air. He's wounded. And as he begins to lose the eye of the tiger, and as his shoulders begin to, to, to stoop, and he begins to walk, his little wife is freaking out. She's worried about him. She doesn't know what's going on. So she leaves, grabs a squirrel, brings it back, cuts it, opens it, lays it at his feet. He can't eat, but he can drink the blood. And if he buries his face in that blood, he'll never fly to the top of the sky again. He'll never be that champion again. But for the rest of his life, he will be attached to his food by its stench. It's so important to always have a fresh word from the Lord. It's always so important. Don't let things of yesterday hang you up and trap you and trip you and whatever. The promises of God are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. We have pastors, we have books, we have television, but it's up to us to really pursue the meat of the gospel and to, and to hear what God is saying and have it confirmed from the pulpit. That's, that's up to us for that to happen. So he looks at that kill. And Steve, he makes, he makes up his mind. He either compromises or he remembers. Compromises the good hand of the Lord upon him. And he shakes his face at that, and then he makes his way back to that rock. He can't fly. Sometimes it takes him a full day to make it to the rock. And when he walks up to that rock and stands on the edge and remembers where his nest went, he takes that beak that's infected and he will reach over and grab that feather that's become tattered and worn and beat up and he will rip that feather from his shoulder and he'll let it drop the way his nest dropped. And then he'll take that beak and he'll begin to remove those feathers that are corroded and they're, and they're bent and they're broken and he will remove the feathers from his chest and from his thighs and he'll take those powerful talons that have become crusty and infected and he'll begin to crush it against the rock and that it will rip off that old dead skin the last thing he does he takes his beak and he crushes it against the rock and that old beak comes off and there he stands and for the next 40 days he goes through a healing process there's a little stream there that he has water to drink there's a place where the bees deposit honey. He can't eat meat, but he goes over and he buries his face in that honey. You know, I've learned you can, you, you can be working in a nursery and touching those little babies and feed them honey and give them a heart for the things of God. And sometimes the nursery ministry is more important than the pulpit ministry. And I thank God that he uses us in every single area of our life. No place is unimportant with God. Every place is important. But every year the bees would come and leave that honey and no one would ever need it. But that didn't stop them from leaving the honey. And then all of a sudden one day the honey was needed. And that 
That's your life. That's your destiny. Keep being consistent on what you're consistent at, and God will bless it, and God will turn it around, and you'll see the hand of God on your life, on your life. So he, so he, so Kim, the feathers come back, taller, straighter, thicker. The talons return powerful, rip branches off of trees. The beak gets completely restored. And somewhere on the, four, the 35th to the 40th day, he will walk up to the edge of that rock. I have talked with Indians that live their life for this moment. They will get those powerful binoculars, the, that, that t- powerful telescope, and they will look at the eagle, and the eagle will look, lift his face towards the sun and tears begin to come down the side of the face of the eagle and the eagle opens its mouth and it makes a sound they've never heard an eagle make before and he will yell at the sun and then he will mount up not back to his family but he'll mount up to where he last saw the sun and he will fly so high and so far that day that he becomes invisible but they that wait upon the Lord they shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings as eagles they shall run and not be weary they shall walk and not faint that's why David said bless the Lord O my soul and all that is within me bless his holy name bless the Lord O my soul and forget not all who his benefits who redeemeth thy life from destruction who healeth all thy diseases who forgiveth all thy iniquity who satisfieth thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like an eagle <laughs> let me tell you the last chapter The eagle, like many great warriors in the Bible, like many great men and women that have lived in America, knew his time had come. And he would make his way back to that rock with great difficulty. And he would lay there where his nest once lay and he'll lay his head down and he will die with his eyes on the sun. You want to live like an eagle? You got to die like an eagle. You got to give it all away. Not my will, but thine be done. It's all up to you. Just a moment as every head is bowed, as every eye is closed. My piano friend, will you help me? Or my worship, my worship. If you're here this morning, and you've wandered away from the things of God or you're here this morning and you're not eternally secure you're not sure of your destiny you're not sure of your future you're not sure of your eternity but this morning something has happened something inside of you leapt when the music began you sensed something it's not something that you can purchase or put on but it's It's in the spirit. And deep in your heart, your heart was touched and your heart was shaken. And you begin to like what you were experiencing and you begin to address what you felt. God brought you here today to connect you to him. He is a connector. That's what he does. We have no life outside of him. Oh, there are things that we do and we try to find pleasure, but there's no real pleasure because only Jesus can satisfy your soul. If you've wandered away from God this morning, I promise you I will not embarrass you, come to you. That's not the way I roll. But if you're here this morning and you're not where you need to be with the Lord, could you just put your hand up and put it right back down? I'm not where I need to be with the Lord. Yes, thanks took a lot of guts you don't know me that took a lot of guts we're both guests today there's one more I feel like there's another I'm not I'm not where I need to be with the Lord I love the Lord but there's just been some stuff in my life there's just been some things that have happened and I'm not yes thank you thank you is there one more we want to wait just for you because you are worth it all you are worth it all you're here this morning and you're just running on empty there's just been some stuff that's tried to distract you and steal your joy and steal your focus and you're just you're 
you're glad you came you're part of the family but there needs to be a breakthrough there needs to be a turnaround moment in your life and you've you've come this morning with faith believing and you're at a place where you're saying i'm just i'm just wanting to break through i want to reconnect i want i want that joy that i had i want to i want that restored to me i want the purpose and plan of god obvious in my life i don't i don't walk in shadows or clouds or, or I, I want to know that i know if that's where you're at would you please put your hand up just a little yeah you know, just a little burnout just a little yeah sure Sure. I'm going to ask you that lift your hands that just need to just reconnect with the Lord. Those of you that lift your hand and said, you know what? I'm not where I need to be with the Lord. I want you to join them as they come to meet me in this altar area. Those of you that lifted your hands would just come and join me right in this altar area. I'm not going to embarrass you or call you out. But I want to reconnect this morning in this altar. Would you come all over this house? Those, yes, yes. As they are coming, if just help me in prayer, Lord, give us courage. Give us courage to respond to this word. Give us courage. Yes. Though, Pastor Hank, I'm not really where I need to be with the Lord. Come as these are, are coming and we're gonna we're gonna pray together. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. This morning when part of the team came in the office to pray, I want those that, that came this morning to pray with Pastor Steve just to form a hedge around these that have come and stood to know they're not standing alone, but we are standing with them. And this morning, God's going to turn it around. God, Brother Al, would you come and stand behind some of these two and help me pray? Here's what I want you to do in this house, all of this house. If you feel comfortable, I just like you to close your eyes. And however you picture Calvary, if you've been to Israel, they've showed you what they thought was Golgotha. But in your prayer time, there's a place in your mind that you see, and that's where Jesus died. If there's that place in your spirit, I want you to go there with me just for a moment. I want you to go with me to that hill, to that cross. David said, give ear to my word, O Lord, consider my meditation. I want you to see the cross in the middle. And I want you to know that's the cross of Christ. And I want you with me to walk right up to that cross. I'm with you in this. I want you to walk. I want you to get as close as you can. I want you to get where you can reach out and touch that beam if you wanted to. I want, that's how close I want you to get. Then I want you to look up. And I want you to see the wounds in his hands and his feet and his head and his face on the sides. And as that blood begins to coagulate, begins to drop from his body and hit the dirt there on the ground that you're standing on. This morning, would you not allow a single drop of blood to hit the dirt, but would you take one step closer? And would you let that blood fall on you? Would you let that warm blood from Calvary fall upon your head and your shoulders? And would you, and would you just let that do what it does? Just let the blood of Jesus Christ wash and let that blood of Jesus Christ restore. And if you can see that this morning, we just lift both those hands towards the Lord and thank Him. Thank Him for again doing what seems impossible to do. Thank Him for restoring what seems to be impossible to restore. Thank Him for dealing with my doubt, dealing with my fear dealing with my anxiety, dealing with my trauma. Hank, I'm at a place where I really need God to show up. I'm at a place where I really need a breakthrough. I'm, at a, I'm doing all the right things. I love the Lord. I'm a part of the family of God. But there's more to me than this. There's more to me. There's some, there's some, there's some dreams and there's some visions and there's some, there's some prophecies. Some things have been spoken over me and I've written them down and I'm at a place now where I want to, if God, if God will allow me, I want to leap to that place that he has for me. I want to go to that place he has for me. In the hands of surrender, we say, Lord, we surrender all. We confess our sins. We ask you to be the Lord of our life, to wash away our sins, wash away our shortcomings, wash away those things. Make us brand new in your sight. Make us, make us valuable and viable. Make us realize that we're in a place that we can do this for you. We can, we can do this. We are here. We are ready to press forward one just a little closer to you. Just a little closer in this relationship. Just a little nearer to you this morning. 
Congregation, would you point your hands towards these in the altar? Just help me pray. Father, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by your spirit that we pray. Yes, we do, Father, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, touch this life, touch this woman of God. Remove anything that you don't want her to carry, but let your presence overwhelm her, her joy. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I give it all to you, Lord. I give it. It's all yours. It's all yours. I don't want any of it. I give it to you. I trust you. I trust you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It's not by mind. It's not by power, but it's by your spirit. I give your spirit permission to operate in my life. I'm not afraid of you. I trust you. I trust your direction. And I will submit. I will do what you call me to do in Jesus' name. I say yes, Lord. I say yes. I withhold nothing. I hold nothing back. I'm all in. I'm type A. I'm all in, Lord. It's all about you. And I'm ready to take that step. I'm ready to take that plunge. I do that in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Answer every question. Open every door. Supply every need. Let your daughter know that she is in that little nest. And you've got her. You're watching over her. You're feeding her and clothing her. There's going to come a window when you're going to push her out of that nest. And she's going to soar that anointing that you prophesied over her. You declared over her and this precious child. We agree right now in Jesus, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Touch this woman of God. You're carrying something God does not want you to carry. He wants you to leave it here. It's, you're not God. It's not, it's not you that this is going to be manifest. God said, I want you to leave this burden here with me. I don't want you taking it with you. It doesn't belong to you. I don't want your steps to be wearied. I'm going to give you the steps of a calf in the spring day when he leaps from that stall and he dances and he plunges and he sees that pasture. A brand new day, a brand new season. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, touch this man of God. You know what he has laid here. You know the questions he has asked. You know the answers that he's after. He is a thinker. He's a meditator. He is a he, he, he processes things. Allow your spirit to be a part of his spirit. Allow this processing to begin and let him know that you've got your hand on his life, that you're motivating him. Financially, I see a door opening financially that God is touching here in Jesus' name. Oh, can we give a Lord just wave our hands all over this house and love on him for a moment? Love on him for a moment. Don't give up. Just press in just a little bit closer. Just a little bit closer. This is a man of honor. This is a man of integrity. And this is a man that does what he's asked or told to do. You can trust him. You can use him. You can open a window of heaven and bathe him. And show him just a little bit more of his destiny that you have for him. Answer the questions. Open the doors. Let your spirit confirm in his spirit that we are where we need to be. In Jesus' name. We're where we need to be. In Jesus' name. Touch these hungry hands. Hands of surrender. Hands, I'm wide open to you, Lord. I'm wide open to you. I'm, I withhold nothing. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm just, I'm so hungry for you to do something in my life. I'm so hungry to be used of you. Take this attitude. Take this, take this anointing and use it for your glory. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. There's a deep river here. And those that know you know that there's a deep river here. You are a man of wisdom. And you're a man of few words. But when you think and when you say something, it's deep. And the deep is calling to the deep. If you'll trust him, he's going to show you some other things that are pretty deep and they're pretty heavy. But he's already, he trusts you. He said, that's a vessel I can use. That's a vessel I can trust. And that's a vessel that when he speaks, people listen in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Touch this handmaid. Touch her worship. As she's been in your presence today, honor her. And let her know that one of her dances is one of your favorites. This is one of your favorite dancers. And one of her, her attitude, you, you, you look towards it, you lean towards it, and you love it. Let her know that she's a handmaid that is loved. 
Let her know that she's a handmaid, that her dance has touched the heart of God, and it's only going to get better. It's only going to get richer, deeper, thicker in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I want you to look at me just I want you to look at me just for a minute. I tell you what I saw in my spirit. I saw I saw your car parked. And it was either in front of a courthouse or a post office. And the car in front of you has a ticket on the windshield. And I see the driver of that car walking up to his car and getting that ticket off his windshield and putting it on your windshield. And he drove off. And you're assuming the responsibility of something that you're not supposed to assume the, re, assume the responsibility for. The enemy is trying to wear you out and wear you down and keep you frustrated and keep you with questions. But God says, I'm removing the ticket from her. I'm removing the ticket from her. And she will breathe me. And she will breathe me. And she will know that I am near. I'm not forgotten. I am in control. And I will provide, saith the Father, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Can we just wave our hand to the Lord? Just, just wave our hand to the Lord. I want you to look at me. For, I want you to look at me. God just wants to confirm and remind you are not a thermometer. You are a thermostat. And you're tied into God's power. And when you worship and when you dance, you're, pre you're creating a place for God to sit. He's not coming just to visit or revive, but he says, I will dwell. I will take up residence. God wants you to know he takes up residence in your praise. He takes up residence in your worship, even when you don't feel like praising. Even when the storms are kind of pushing it from one angle to another, he wants you to know he's got it all under control. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep trusting. Leave it with him and let him work on it. Is that okay? In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Don't you love the Lord? Touch his handmaiden. What she brings to this, this altar. I just speak restoration in Jesus' name. I, I, some things have been stolen from you. Some things have been taken from you. You've been done wrong. And there's some bad stuff in the past. The Lord said, I want you to know old things are passed away. All things are become new. A new place. A new window. A new door. I'm observing. I'm watching. And I speak newness to you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Whatever that means in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. As you intercede for those that you love and you're worried about, God said, my son intercedes for you. He knows your little nickname. He knows everything about you. He knows the things that's been taken, the things that's been lost, and some of the things that's been restored. He just wants you to know he's not done. He's putting some things, like that song says, picking up the pieces of my life, bringing new releases just in time. God said, I'm going to bring some new stuff to her, and it's going to be so phenomenal, she will have no doubt it's of me. There's no way man can do what I'm about to do. There's no way money can do what I'm about to do. There's no way family can do what I'm about to do. I'm going to work in her behalf, and many are going to see it and know it and give me the glory in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. He's saying, God, don't scare me. Don't embarrass me. Don't push me. Don't, don't let me fall down. That was your... God honors that. There is, there is integrity here, and there's sophistication here. And you are light. And there are people watching your life. You are impacting people. They're watching your integrity. Your work habits are very important. They're watching. God has planted you in an area that you're the only light that will probably shine. And they're going to watch your light. Take no thought of what you're going to say or do. God will bring the timing. He'll bring the words. And you'll know it's Him. In Jesus' name. new day it's a new season God heard those vows God heard those promises God heard those declarations and he's here to tell you you need to review them write them down read them for that which I said I would do I will do I will not forget you you will not stand to the side but I will bring you to the front 
and I will keep my promise, saith the Father, in Jesus' name. That makes sense? That's scary. It usually doesn't make sense. <laughs> Steve, if you'll come. Thank you so much for your trust in this ministry. We love all that God is doing here and so proud. And, and uh, we just honor you and honor your family. Don't go anywhere. Pastor Rhonda, where'd she go? Would you come, please? Matt, step over here with me, if you would, please. So grab two chairs, set them right here, please. Those of you in the front, you can be seated for a moment, if you would, please. Whew! Mm. would please be seated for a moment. What you don't know Thirty-three years ago today, come with me, babe, please. Can you stand on this edge? I'm asking a lot. Of her. We're being eagles right now. <laughs> but thirty-three years ago today, uh, when I when I when I got up that morning, I didn't know what that night would hold. I didn't care really. I knew what the day would hold, and um, but everybody here knows the story and knows that uh, where I ended up, and I ended up under the, your voice, and I heard the voice of God within your voice. I didn't know what that meant then. I know what that means today. I cannot tell you how much it means. <laughs> to me that you guys were faithful I would have none of this I would not be joined to this amazing people if you had been unfaithful I wouldn't know God I wouldn't have the life I love to live I'm alive I have joy I have the most amazing bride on the planet my kids rise up in the morning and honor me most every day. <laughs> these people, they walk in these doors, I'm honored every week. None of this would exist if it wasn't for both of your faithfulness. Too often, too often, in fact, every day, People withhold their honor until the people in front of them are lying in a casket. They save their best words for a time when they can't be heard by the one that deserved the words. I release to you my words and the words of this people today. Not in a time when you can't hear them, but in a time when you can. And everybody in this house has received a word to honor you. And today, as the two of you sit here, we're going to bring our letters and we're going to begin to place letters of honor in this basket. I want you both to know how you have impacted my life and what you see in this building. It's not vast. It's not large when you, what you see with your eye. But in the kingdom of God, there are no walls this place is immeasurable. We are changing the earth today because you changed my world. Because you did that. 
we carry on. After you, so much happened. Apostle Ball came into my life and relationships and people and things, but none of that happened without knowing you. I said it earlier and I say it again. You guys are the genesis of my relationship with Jesus Christ today. You are the beginning for me. You spoke a word. So my wife and I first are going to come and we're going to lay our letters in this basket. If you would grab yours. And then I'm going to ask each of you, take your letter in your hand and stand. I don't want anybody to leave. I don't know what comes next, but I don't want anybody to leave. But we're not done yet. We're going to honor Pastor Hank and Pastor Rhonda with the words Holy Spirit has put in our heart. Bring that to them. Hug their neck. Quickly move out of the way so the next person can come. But we honor you today.